Hi chemists. Welcome to one of your choices in the section on polyatomic ions on your unit menu. By the end of this video, you should be able to write chemical formulas and names for compounds containing polyatomic ions and determine the Roman numerals for transition elements. While you're completing this video, make sure that you're taking notes and make sure you have your periodic table nearby. Recall, up until this point, we've only talked about monatomic ions. And when we talk about monatomic cations, these are ions that essentially have the same name as the element. Remember, we didn't change the name on the metal. So for example, if you saw sodium, that was called the sodium ion. And if you had calcium, that was the calcium ion. Whenever you had a monatomic anion, you had the ending of the element changed to IDE. And so that's where you had to change the ending of the nonmetals to IDE. So for example, you had chloride or oxide. Now these are monatomic. Now we're going to move on to something called polyatomic. So polyatomic ions are actually found on the back of your periodic table. And polyatomic ions are usually made up of two or more elements that are covalently bonded together with an overall positive or negative charge. You can see there are quite a list of these. Fortunately, you will not have to memorize them and you'll be given this reference sheet on every test and on every quiz. So here's some examples. So let's say you have aluminum sulfite. You obviously know where aluminum is on the periodic table, but let's say you were confused and you were looking for the sulfite anion. Well, you wouldn't ever find it anywhere on the side of the periodic table. There's no element called sulfite. So if you ever see the ending ITE, that's a clue that that must be a polyatomic ion. So if you flip your periodic table over, you'll see sulfite, and what it ends up looking like is SO3 with a two minus charge. The good news is, is that whenever we're writing formulas, we're gonna do it the same exact way as we did before in that we are still gonna make sure that those charges add up to zero. So since aluminum is three plus and sulfite is two minus, what we're gonna to have to do is add another aluminum and another sulfite and then a, a third sulfite after that. And again, it works the same exact way in that you see that you have two aluminums and you have three sulfites. You just have to be a little careful here though because with this one, you're seeing that you need the parentheses around SO3. What those parentheses indicate is basically that you're going to have three of those SO3 polyatomic ions. It's almost like the distributive property in math class in that this three goes to the oxygen and it also goes to the sulfur. So you wanna make sure that you always put parentheses around your polyatomic ions whenever you have more than one. Let's try another example. So this is lithium nitrate. So again, if you look on the periodic table, you'd be able to find lithium no problem. It's right there in group one with the alkali metals. But if you looked in your periodic table for nitrate, you wouldn't find it. You have to flip over. And if you look on the back, you'll see there are other polyatomic ions that have the ATE ending. So that's another sign. If you have the ite ending or the ATE ending, that's a sign that we're looking on the back of the periodic table at the polyatomic ion sheet. So for this one, when you look up lithium and nitrate in those charges, they end up being plus one and minus one. So this one isn't too bad for writing the formula in that it's LiNO3. Notice that parentheses are not included. Um, they're really optional when you're writing this. Just because you only have one nitrate ion, you don't need to indicate any kind of parentheses. So now what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about how to determine when you need a Roman numeral and what that Roman numeral is. And this is a skill that sometimes students have a difficult time with. So um, if you have elements that are, are capable of more than one possible charge, right, we mostly see those elements in the transition metal section. Um, one of the things that I do is I focus on what the charge on the anion is, what the charge on the nonmetals are, in order to figure out what the charge is on the metal. So Here's an example. So I have this compound Fe2CrO43. And so the first thing I see is that we have iron. And based off of my prior knowledge, I know that iron definitely needs a Roman numeral. But for those of you that aren't sure, what you wanna do is look at your periodic table 
And on the periodic table, you wrote down the elements that have more than one possible charge. What you want to do is anytime you see that you have more than one possible charge, like in the case of iron, that's telling you, okay, I need a Roman numeral. For something like silver or palladium, these two only have one possible charge, and so that's why we do not need a Roman numeral for those. The only time you'll need them is if you have more than one possible charge, like you see with iron. So what I do, like I said, is I focus on what's the charge on this part of the formula here. So we said chromate is a polyatomic ion, it's on the back, and um, it has a 2 minus charge. But notice that there is a 3 here. So this is 2 minus times 3. There's a net charge of negative 6 on the right-hand side of this compound. On the left-hand side, we know that since the compounds have to be neutral, this side has to be positive 6. But if you look on the periodic table, there's no positive 6 there. There's either 2 or 3. And that's where you have to say, well, if this side is positive 6, we have to divide that positive 6 among the two irons there. And so that's why you'll do the positive 6 divided by 2. And that'll tell you that the charge in the iron has to be positive 3. So that when you write the chemical name, you'll be writing iron 3 chromate. Let's try another one. So in this case, um, we're looking at the SN here. Now, tin um, definitely requires a Roman numeral. And I know that because when you look on your periodic table, you can see tin could be 2 or 4. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, again, base what the charge is off of what we see with our anion. So CO3 is called carbonate. And if you look where carbonate is, it actually has a minus 2 charge. So it's going to be minus 2 times the 2 here. That tells you that on the right-hand side, there's a net charge of negative 4. And because all compounds have to be neutral, if this side of the compound is minus 4, guess what? This has to then be positive 4. There's only one of them, so I don't have to do any division here. So that when you write the name of this, it's going to be tin 4 carbonate. Here's another one. So CO is cobalt. This is another one that when you look on the periodic table, you see that it has more than one possible charge. It could be 2 plus or 3 plus. To figure out which one, we're going to look at the chromate again. So we have minus 2 times 3, which will give you negative 6. And then if this is negative 6, that means this side has to be positive 6. Divide that by 2, that means that each cobalt has to be plus 3. And so therefore, it'll be cobalt 3 chromate. So hopefully this helped you kind of piece together how to write um, chemical names with both Roman numerals and polyatomic ions. As always, you'll have plenty of practice. Good job.